Welcome back to another Unstoppable podcast series. I am so excited about our guest today. We have recording country artist and rapper Smo. How are you doing today, sir? Better than I ever imagined I would be. Well, I just want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day. And you're already doing some awesome things today, which we'll get into in a little bit. But I'm going to let you do your own introduction. I love my guests doing their own introduction because you're going to tell more about yourself than I could ever could. So, the floor is yours, Mr. Smo. Well, for those who don't know me, uh, my name, my real name is John Smith. Um, oh, you need in there? Sorry. <laughs> We're running a business. This is my wife, Sarah Beth. I've been uh, talking to her. She's awesome. We're actually, and just to give everybody the lead in, we're actually uh, at our, um, in our hometown, we have a, a good friend that has a food trailer that she does smoothies and we're introducing our plant-based menu in her food truck this week. So awesome. uh, all, all, all organic, all homemade, all our recipes. And it's the first time that we've ever like uh, food prepped for, uh, for sale, you know? So yeah. this morning, this morning has been very educational so far. Uh, <laughs> So uh, for those for, for those who don't know me, my real name is John Smith. I was uh, born in San Diego, California, because that's where my dad was stationed in the Navy. Um, not long after I was born, uh, my dad retired from the Navy and he moved me and uh, my mother and him. We moved back here to their hometown, Bedford County, Tennessee, which is where I've been for the remainder <laughs> of my life. Uh I came up very uh, simple, you know, just normal family, had great parents. Um, I had a older sibling um, that was a big influence, you know, on my life and my career. And, and uh, his, my, my dad's music and his music kind of paved the way to what I listened to. Um, it's funny because when I think about my past story, I really start to realize how much domesticated programming goes into creating a human. You know, we kind of all come out as a blank canvas and then the people that you're around and the things that they kind of expose you to is what starts to make the skin on your body, you know what I'm saying? And then eventually you grow into that skin and you become this person that the people that you grew up around kind of programmed you to be. Right. Uh, so I'm very much a product of that program. Uh, raised in small town, Tennessee, uh, very small town, uh, real, real cool uh, family. My family's always been cool. I had the best dad. My dad passed away. It's been like 16 years now. It's, it's been some time. Uh, I lost my dad to cancer. I still have my mother, though, and uh, I take care of her. She's a firecracker. Um, anybody that's watched my TV show knows Mama Smo. Uh, and she's doing great. Like, she's loving life. So, you know, um, she's, she's getting up in age, though, so it's a little tricky. Um, but, yeah, I, I grew up on on uh my dad's music i grew up on my brother's music and then when i was old enough to own my own music i had kind of a, a blend of both of those my brother was into a lot of uh east coast hip-hop break dancing music this was like in the early 80s and then my dad was straight outlaw country uh and you know pretty much just standard country is what he liked and um so i grew up under those two fellows and then my mother she was she's very baptist uh church so we had to go to church you know we went to church every sunday and sang every sunday in choir and stuff like that so uh i was always around music like my family was very musical as far as listening to it but not really uh writing it or making it nobody in my whole family that i know of ever made music Wow. Uh, or was it or was in the music business or ever did anything like that but we all enjoy music and uh that rubbed off on me probably more than anything and i grew up uh, playing different instruments i had a live drum set i had a keyboard i had a guitar i had 
uh, turntables. I had, you know, and then as I got older, you know, big stereos and all that stuff. So I, music's just always been like one of the cornerstones of my life. But right around the age of 14, um, here in this small town that I grew up in, uh, I committed my first felony. I blew, I, I blew up a bunch of mailboxes. Oh, no. <laughs> which is what 14-year-olds do. That, that small town I, news got to go in, didn't yeah. it? <laughs> I blew up a bunch of mailboxes. And I blew up a Pepsi machine. Oh, man. And I got, I got a lot of trouble for it, as I should. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, I guess they thought that I was going to be like some Unabomber type person. <laughs> so they, uh, they put me uh, with a counselor. So at 14, I'm going to like counseling. Real sweet lady, really cared about uh, how I, my, what my outcome was going to be. And she told me, she, and no one had ever told me, uh, to write down anything, you know, like write down what you're feeling, write down what's on your mind. <laughs> so my counselor uh, is the one that kind of got me started on writing. And I started writing short stories, just stuff in my head. I started writing poetry uh, when I'm around the sixth and seventh grade, when I was really had it for one of these girls here in Bedford County. <laughs> I would write love poems and leave it on her desk, you know, <laughs> and then uh, those poems turned into lyrics. Mm -hmm. And that's how I became a songwriter. As I blew up a bunch of mailboxes, got in trouble, <laughs> got forced to write and then found out that I had a knack for it. Mm -hmm. And not only did I was I good at it, but it it started to become very therapeutic that's because awesome. I found yeah, I found the freedom to say whatever I wanted to say without having to say it to someone, you know what I'm saying? I could just write it down. Right. Absolutely. I think, I think you girls call it a diary. A diary. That's what we call it. A diary. Yeah. yeah a diary. Yeah. <laughs> Boys call it unrecorded records. There you go. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Well, I have so, a bunch um, of songs in my, my, my diary. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Uh, so yeah, I, I got into writing. And, uh, and I, I was in the band, uh, in, the, in the middle school band, I played trumpet. And then I switched over to the drum line. I was in the drum line through high school. And uh, by my sophomore year, I dropped out of the band and started to become like, a, I guess what they would call it is a backwood hippie, mm -hmm. uh, you know? Um, and just started to go down a different path, you know what I'm saying? Different music, I got really into like, classic rock pink floyd the doors zeppelin all that good stuff you know uh -huh. and uh and i was wild i was wild as <laughs> as anything in, in high school so but not long after i got out of high school and i realized that i wanted to try to make some music a buddy of mine he had like a drum machine and a guitar and a microphone and he was playing the guitar and i was like learning this drum machine and i figured out how to make like this little simple beat and I was like oh keep playing that part and I'm gonna keep playing this and I was like oh I think I just made my first like <laughs> music yeah so this this was before computers we had an eight track tape recorder not an eight track player but where you could record up to eight tracks on a cassette tape and uh, I started recording music in my parents basement on a on an eight track recorder uh with my like my dad's aviation headphones it was like a like super thrown together deal with a radio shack microphone oh my goodness this, and this is like this is like 98 you know huh? and um cutting these i had a few records they were super stupid like real terrible but i was recording them and putting them on cassette tapes and going to parties and like hey man pop my tape in you know what i'm saying <laughs> People are like, oh, man, is this you? And I'm like, yeah, man. And I just like, <laughs> I saw the impact that that had. Like, people were like really impressed that I was able to, on my own, yeah. capture my music, right? So that evolved, of course. And then, you know, fast forward um, about a decade of learning how to produce my own music write better lyrics, record my vocals, mix my music, master my music, put it on CD, do the artwork, shoot the video, 
do the promo, like everything, book the show, go to the show, set up the sound equipment, wow. do the show. Like I did every job, like shooting my own music video, you know, back before YouTube was even really a thing. Right. And I was doing, I was doing that when I was like 10. I got a video from a VHS tape that my family has held on to for dear life <laughs> of me when I was like 10. Aviation glasses, camouflage uh, 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 outfit that my dad had got me from like the uh, army surplus store. Yeah. Um, you know, just the dude that I am today. Right. But right. like at 10, at yeah. 10, yeah. singing, singing uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, parents don't understand. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I love it. Uh, and, and, and the fat boys. And so, like, I was filming that stuff. And when I come uh, hang out with your husband, if you're there, I'll show you the video. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, Please do. I show it to people all the time. I'm like, yo, this is me at 10. <laughs> and I like, this is me at 46. I'm like the same dude. Uh, so I, I really got into, like, making music, you know what I'm saying? And, like, being an artist. and then all, But also, like, being the label. Yeah. And being the being the manager and being the the graphics designer, the videographer, the producer, the everything. Like I wore every one of my own hats. And I think that was the the coolest thing about my journey is that being able to like self-taught a lot of this stuff. And you know, like you, you're gonna make mistakes yeah. no matter what you do. You can mess up making a glass of water. Absolutely. You spill it, spill it all over the place, you know, to take the first drink and it goes down your shirt, you know, yeah. like you can, you can mess up doing anything. And I made a lot of mistakes, but the main thing I did is I learned from my mistakes and then I applied those lessons to my next, you know, goal. So I wouldn't make the same mistake. And I think that's what people uh, miss out on. It's like, it's okay to make mistakes. Yeah. It's like, you, you, it's okay to do things wrong until you figure out how to do it right. Then it's not okay to do things wrong after that, right? Exactly. Like exactly. anything, anything in life worth doing is worth doing poorly yes. until you know how to do it. I love because that. that's, that's how you figure out yes. how to do things. You know what I'm saying? The first time you go to hammer a nail in, you're going to hit your thumb. That's how you learn to hold a nail and swing a hammer, right? And you right. get good at it. Yeah. So anything worth doing is worth doing poorly until you learn how to do it right. That I, I live by that. Um, and I think a lot of people need to give themselves the opportunity to do things poorly and to not be so hard on themselves. You know what I'm saying? Like good. life's going to, life's going to, leave some knots on your head, especially if you got dreams. Like you could be a dreamless individual and life might take it pretty easy on you. You know what I'm saying? You can stay in the shadows, you can hang out on the bench and you can stay out of danger. But like, if you really are passionate about your goals and your dreams and you know that you have greatness inside of you, then like you're gonna go after those things and life is gonna whoop your butt left and right for the for good reasons right because anything worth having is also worth busting your butt for absolutely absolutely uh and and that's what i did with the music i just worked hard you know i knew what i wanted uh I, and i already knew i could do it on my own so when it came time when when managers started calling when labels started calling i was a little better equipped to deal with what my expectations were from them rather than just being this excited artist with an right. opportunity right. that in the, in the early two thousands, that's all anybody thought that they were supposed to do is get signed by a major label. Right. If I could just get signed by a major label, you know what I'm saying? All that's changed now, you know, like there's barely any major labels around and you don't need to get signed by a major label because you can do everything yourself now with the internet and the social media and all these platforms and opportunities. And like, you don't even have to burn CDs anymore. God, I remember <laughs> I would, I would record my music. I would sit down with a hundred CDs, a spool of a hundred and burn each one, print out a label that had my, home phone number on it because I didn't have a cell phone at the time 
And then I would go down to Second Avenue, Nashville, and stand on the corner and give my CDs away. Hey, man, check this out. I don't want to buy that. No, 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 I'm not selling nothing. I want you to just listen. Wow. Just please give me the opportunity to hear what I have to do. And it had my email. It had my, my MySpace. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I was like early in the game. I knew how to like promote my stuff and, and get heard. But before I even stepped to Nashville, I did that here in my hometown. So I'm a firm believer in like, if you can't, if you can't do for your hometown, then don't even step outside of that circle. Like right. you need, you need to build a relationship with your community. You need to let them know who you are and the service that you provide and then give them that service and then they'll support you. Yeah. That's why, that's why this food truck is going to be popping all day today is because I'm in my hometown trying to provide a, a healthy service for my community. Absolutely. Uh, and it, that's a hard thing to argue with. It'd be different. You know, there's people out here selling methamphetamines in my community. <laughs> we're not, we're not supporting them. No. Uh, we're trying to support a healthy living, positive energy and being a better version of yourself tomorrow. Uh, that's kind of like our, our thing. So the journey to get to where I am now was a whole, like it, every step of the way is what got is part of the blueprint that what got me where I am today. Uh, but when major labels and management came, of course, I was ecstatic at the time because we didn't have, like, there was no streaming. Uh, streaming wasn't really a thing yet. Huh? I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologize for everyone. Hey, what is it? I'm on, I'm doing a podcast. So yeah. Uh, so yeah. The the journey was a it was a long it was a bumpy road, but it was uh, rewarding without a doubt. Uh, and I learned even more when I got into the major labels, and you know I I learned a lot about the music industry, the music business, uh, all the things that you really can't learn on your own as an independent artist because you're not in the throes of everything right publishing masters songwriting uh like uh, and then once streaming came in like streaming and like the ownership of your music no there is no real or at least i didn't take a class that taught you these things i just had to learn as i went yeah. you know yeah. um and then after the major label that then the tv show you know, so it was like, and it was fast. It, all this stuff happened fast. It was, was like, like 2014, right? Is that when that came out? Yeah, 14. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. awesome. I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, so that was that was a big, you know, that was another big college course for me. Yeah. I'd never, I'd never been on TV. Uh -huh. I filmed myself a lot, you know what I'm saying? And, and we had even shot our own episodic show and put it out on YouTube as if it was our TV show. And, uh, but like 30 people, mm -hmm. all, like 30 crew members in your house, four or five cameras, cast, oh, catering yeah. every day for three years oh. of your life. Uh -huh. <laughs> that would be, woo, yeah, that I would, quite, I would have to do. Yeah. <laughs> quite the education, right? So, but priceless, yeah. nonetheless, regardless of what I had to go through, like, None of my friends know what it's like to have to, nobody I know, even, even in the industry, I don't know anybody that knows what it's like to have to have your own TV show. Right. right. Um, you know, so it was an education that like a lot, not a lot of people get. And, uh, and I love, I love film. Like put yeah. me in front of a camera. I'm good to go. You're like good. I'll get, I'll get my lines the first time. You won't have to do a bunch of film. Like I know what to do. I'll improvise the whole thing and we'll keep it moving. That's awesome. uh, so I, I was really good at TV, um, but this is where we'll bend into the unhealthy factor. Uh -huh. the, hap the, the most successful moments of my life when it comes to industry success right. was my most unhappiest and unhealthiest time of my life. Mm. I, was the, I weighed 390 pounds. I was completely morbidly obese, super unhappy in a terrible relationship. Uh, the industry had me by the throat. You know, the labels 
They want delivery, 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 the TV show, delivery, 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 tour, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, every week, on, living on a tour bus, you know. Uh, all these things are great things, but like all of them at once mm -hmm. will lead you to a heart attack or open a heart surgery, <laughs> which is what happened to me. Um, so like, you know, of course the stress and the work and everything caught up to me and uh, I was on tour on the West Coast and in Canada, huge tour, biggest tour of my career. And I felt like there was a, someone parked a truck on my chest. I was like, I don't know what's going on, but something hurts right here. Mm -hmm. And I went to several different hospitals while I was on the road. Nobody could figure out what was wrong. And then my bus driver, took me to the Mayo Clinic when we came out of Canada and into uh, Minnesota. And he said, I'm taking you to the Mayo Clinic. I made you an appointment with a cardiologist. And I was like, what? And he's like, you're going. And he was a good friend of mine. Right. My, my bus driver became like my brother. Cause I mean, he called him my black Jesus. <laughs> uh, right. And he was, he was okay with that. Yeah. Um, cause he saved my life. He took me to that hospital. They, they did one test on me and they said, you, you have blocked arteries. And I was like, okay, so what do we do? And they were like, well, you're going to have to have open heart surgery. And I was like, well, I got a show tomorrow. We, we ain't doing none of that. And they were like, no, 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 you're going to die if you don't. And I was like, you know, what do you do? So I had to cancel two months of a tour which if anybody knows what goes into canceling a two month tour, when you're in a million dollar bus and your band is a seven piece band, I lost everything. Mm -hmm. I lost everything. I lost, I lost my opportunities. I lost a ton of money. I lost momentum. I lost the algorithm. I lost everything. You know, I lost my band. You can't, I can't pay these guys for two months to sit still. Right. They moved on, uh, you know, and then I was stuck. I had to start over from scratch. And at the same time that I was going through my heart surgery, I was also going through a, a multi-million dollar lawsuit over some ex-manager who claimed that he still managed me. I was just like, what? But it's like five years to go through this lawsuit, like $100,000 in legal fees to beat it. And then at the same time, the woman that I was married to on the TV show, I had to divorce her because she was cuckoo could chew. Oh, I don't want to talk bad about nobody because oh, everybody right. has their hard times, but like I got a divorce, right? And it was like, that was a you know, quarter million dollar divorce. I don't even have kids with this girl. We don't even have any marital assets and it still costs me like quarter million dollars. I don't even know how, just cause I am who I am and it was an opportunity. Right. So like I, I, got, I had to start with a clean plate, sure broke, did. no band, no tour, no nothing, none of the stuff that I had just had, you know, but it was like one of the best things that ever happened for me, you know? And um, from there, I just, that's when I started my healthy living, you know, and then that's when I, I stopped eating red meat and pork and fried food and soda. Yeah. And then I did that for and full sobriety for the first time in my life since I was 12. I hadn't been sober since I was 12. Wow, that's so awesome. And I was 39 and sober for the first time, forced, you know, of course, I, I told my my surgeon, he said, I won't even do this surgery on you unless you quit drinking because I was drinking about a half gallon of Jim Beam Red Stag every night on stage oh. and uh didn't really realize that I was an alcoholic because it was just part of my gig right but apparently I was an alcoholic <laughs> <laughs> so cold turkey sober um quit eating a lot of stuff that I used to eat and I had some success you know I lost like uh I lost like 50 pounds pretty quick just from stopping eating uh, fried foods and drinking soda. Awesome. But it, then it, then it, I couldn't guys stuck there, you know what I'm saying? And 
still not happy and I needed to lose a lot more weight. I was like to like 270, 280 pounds. Uh, no, I was even more than that. I was like 320. Um, and then I just, I started to, uh, not feel as good again. And I knew I had to do something. And, uh, luckily my wife, um, we had to, we wasn't married at the time or we were married at the time, but, uh, she, she had me watch this documentary called the game changer. Uh -huh. And, uh, she said, Hey, I think you really need to watch this. It's geared towards men, you know, and I watched it. And it was, it's like plant-based, you know, promoting that and showing the ups, the downs, the controversies and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I watched that documentary, I said, I ain't ate meat since. I haven't had milk since. I haven't had eggs since. I haven't had cheese. I mean, I went full vegan. I went plant-based. Yeah. Um, and three days after I did it, I instantly felt different. Uh, I suffered from acid reflux. Mm -hmm. In a, in a way to where you had to take double the medication to maintain it. And then you dealt with it every day. So it was pretty much like being a prisoner to acid reflux, oh my gosh. you know, it sounds like Travis, he's the same way. <laughs> he's the same. Three, way. Yeah. three days after I quit uh, eating the way that I used to eat, yeah. I stopped having acid reflux. Oh my God. Three days. <laughs> oh my God. That's crazy. Six, six months. Yeah. after going plant-based i was off my medication the acid reflux a year after going plant-based i was able to stop taking my blood pressure medication wow. cholesterol medication two years after being plant-based i was off any medications uh my doctor had cleared me from he was like you've you've basically Fix yourself, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. I was like, all right, cool. And then about a year ago, we got real serious on this. Like I had lost about a hundred pounds, yeah. maybe a little more, mm -hmm. but I, I wanted to like drop some weight. I wanted to add some muscle and I wanted to be stronger. I wanted to be able to do things that I'd never done. And uh, we went, so we went like whole food plant-based. Mm -hmm which is not eating any processed foods. Yeah. Uh, and then I went gluten-free, which is you remove anything that's got wheat in it. Yeah. And then uh, oil-free, which is one of the hardest things that I think anybody living in society could ever do. Yeah. But by going, by going whole food, plant-based, gluten-free, oil-free, I was able to drop 70 pounds quick. And with a lot of exercise, like I, exercise, I went to the gym every day for two hours. I'd leave the gym and I'd go to the pool and I'd work out in the pool for an hour. And then I'd just leave from there and I'd dedicate my rest of my day to healthy eating and healthy choices. And from that, you know, I've gone from 390 where I started around right before my heart surgery to 180. And we're talking about, I wore a five X shirt at one time. I wear a, I wear a large now I wore a size 48, 50 pants. Mm -hmm. Now I wear, wear a size 29. Uh, my shorts are size small. I didn't wear clothes. I didn't wear clothes that fit me like this when I was in middle school. I weighed more in middle school than I do when I do now. Wow. So I've always been fat. I struggled with my weight my whole life. And, uh, Nobody ever really tried to get me to change it, right? I was just always the fat kid in the family. My parents, they didn't, they didn't have a lot of expectations for my health. Right. You know, they didn't know no better. Well, you're from Most the south people, too, you know? Yeah. It's a terrible excuse. Yeah, I, it is. But thank, yeah, I mean, think about people like chicken, 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 fried, fried, fried. It's like, holy crap, it's on every table, every meal. Let me, let me tell you something. That... That you're from the South. Yeah. That was planted. Oh yeah. It, it, it that is. was, that was, that was a domesticated term that was planted among us to keep us eating a terrible lifestyle. Very true. Because now, now everybody has the excuse, but, but is it, is it because you're from the South? Because 
one of the towns in Indiana is the fattest town in America. So, you know, and then I just went to Maine not too long ago and everybody up there was fat. And like everywhere I go now, everybody's overweight. And for the first time, I'm like a normal size and I'm just looking at everybody and I'm just like, I'm like, whoa, I go in the grocery store and I'm like, bro, you don't need yes. six cases of Mountain Dew, my guy. Do you know how much sugar yeah. is in one of those? Have you seen what that much sugar looks like? Do you know what an ounce of white powder looks like? They, yeah. Because you're you're drinking an ounce of white powder. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I don't know. Now I've reprogrammed myself. My domestication, how I was raised is out the door right. because I'm smart enough to know that my parents just didn't know no better. They were doing what it's everybody like, else was doing. They yeah. were sold on convenience, yeah. man. Like everybody was sold on convenience. You know, all this, the convenient fast food, this shit mm -hmm. killed us as, as humans. Like, and you can go back to the, one of the, we've all heard it. And it's this one of the smartest things now that I've ever heard. You are what you eat. That's very true. It is very, very true. I have that written down too. I wrote down what you said about the South, but I also have that written down on another page. You are what you eat. That is true. You are what you eat. I have a question real quick because, yeah. I, you know, I've started this kind of a gluten-free journey because some autoimmune disease in my family and stuff. And mm -hmm. it really helped. It really has helped when I stay that route. So I went into sprouts. I don't know if it's a Murphy's sprout. I don't know if there's one in Shepherd or not. But you know, it's a lot of organic, healthy based. I shop there. Yeah, I, I love that. Place. Yeah. What is somebody that's new to it? Like, I mean, obviously, I want to ask you when we get done the podcast how we can find yeah. what you're doing, what you and your wife are doing. But you know, I looked at my bill. And I'm like, holy crap! And that's why a lot of people, some people, will say, "Dang, it's expensive to eat healthy." What's your What's your take on that? And how would you get people to kind of think differently on that? So it's not expensive right. to eat healthy. Right. I just bought four watermelons for $10. I'm going to juice those watermelons and right. I'm going to drink them all week. Right. So you think about buying a soda or any packaged drink, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be like $3 now. Right. You're only going to get like three of those with four watermelons. I'm going to get 16, 32 ounce mason jars full of watermelon juice. Wow. Yeah. That's just, that's just an example. You so here's, here, yeah. here it is. And, and you can get this. I made this real easy for everybody. Cause you can go on my website mm -hmm. and you can, you can get my shopping list. I've okay. taken my shopping list receipt and my wife has written it all, typed it all out. So you can go to the grocery store. You can even download the PDF version uh -huh. and use it as a checklist. So my wife made the, the shopping list accessible for everyone. That's awesome. And and I remember going to the grocery store and spending three hundred dollars on groceries. When we go to the grocery store now, it's one hundred twenty five. But we also don't shop outside of the produce section. Right, right. We we only eat in the produce section. There is no, we don't go down other aisles at right. all. So that's the other thing. And it, like, it depends on what you're buying. You know, if you're still buying processed food, yeah, it's going to be high Yeah. because somebody had to process it. Someone had to package it. It right. had to get shipped here. It had to get all that stuff. Right. Produce, especially if you can find like, if you're lucky enough to be in a place where they got like a farmer's market, you mm -hmm. know, or if you can have a relationship with, I have a relationship with my produce manager at my Kroger in Murfreesboro. Uh -huh. His name's Chris. Uh -huh. I go in, I juice celery every day. I drink like a 32 ounce mason jar full of celery juice every day. It's life changing. Yeah. Uh, I go into Kroger every week and I buy a case of 30 celery bushels. That's cool. You know, for the whole week. And me and my wife juice celery sometimes twice a day. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Because we, we do it, intermittent fasting. Like we'll eat. Right. Six, six o'clock at night and we won't eat again until the next day around one or two okay i'm doing that right now mine's from like 12, yeah. 12 to six yeah that's good mm -hmm. i'm working out so this is good i'm going to this side as soon as we get done this podcast and check yeah it out. you awesome. you go to my website and go to my social media yeah. blogs <laughs> and uh <laughs> yeah you gotta 
social media. Social media, yeah. We we put all the information in our blogs. That's right. And like we did an e-zine that explains our journey. My wife has lost over a hundred pounds. I've lost over two hundred. So, like it's not, and, and we don't take anything. Uh-huh. Like we don't we don't take any workout stuff. We don't take any fat burner stuff. We're not on a meal prep. Like we just eat plant. We just eat plants. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. easy. Like we eat plants. We don't eat gluten. We don't eat oil. And I mean, and if you can if you can change just your diet, you'll see a huge difference. Now, I would suggest to anyone change your diet first. Right. Don't eat, don't even worry about exercising. Mm-hmm. Dial your diet in because most of the time doing exercise and diet at the same time can be a little too much. Yeah. Dial in, dial in your diet first. Mm-hmm. And then when you have that under control, then start out with some easy exercises. You don't have to go to the gym and blow yourself out. Right. Start at home. Start at home. Do calisthenics. Do push-ups, sit-ups. Like I went my whole life. Let me tell you this. I'm very proud of this. Yeah. I went. I went my entire life never being able to do a pull-up. Not as a kid. Not as a teenager. Not as a man. Have I ever been able to do a pull-up? Until this year, when I turned 46, I did my very first pull-up. Oh my gosh! Good for you. I would be the following. Yeah, the following week I did three. Look at you. The week after that I did five. The week after that I did ten. Jeez. Now I do. Now I do thirty a day. Wow. You know, and I do fifty push-ups. I do fifty sit-ups. You know, I do calisthenics. I do a lot of stretches. I do a lot of resistance strap weight. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like resistance workout. All of these things you can achieve with nothing, like, you know, it's super easy. You don't even have to have a gym. But I would suggest to anyone, dial in that diet first. Mm -hmm. Reprogram yourself and remember that you are what you eat. So only put good things in your body and only good things will come from you. I love that. Uh, There's there's some things I've taken notes while you're talking. And one thing I want to say is, is that your grit and grind is just, off the charts. I, I love that about you. And it sounds like you've got a, a power couple and your wife that's like that. And y'all hold each other accountable and y'all speak into each other's lives. And mm-hmm. I think that that's wonderful. The time that I spoke to her through email so far, I've, I've really, I think she's very professional, very on it. And you can tell she's a huge promoter of you. And I'm, I'm sure you are as her yeah. as well. But what I yes. love about going back and I'm not going to go back too far, but I just want to say when you were talking about how you got started, even in the music industry, you did everything yourself. You said that you filmed the, you filmed the videos. I think so many people, and this goes back to what you're talking about with the music and the health and the eating, right? So many people wait for this perfect little moment of light to come down to like, this is it. I've got to have this, this, and this in order before I start. And you don't, you just have Mm. to start and you can't. You just got to start. Start. Yes. Start right now. Start right now. I don't care what your goal is, whatever your goals and dreams are. You got to start right now. You got to stop talking about it. You got to start doing it. Exactly. People tell me all the time, I can't do what you did. I'm like, yes, you can. You can. Yes, you but can. But you have to start. Exactly. I did a video when I left the gym the other day and I said, look, I haven't always been able to go to the gym. I had kids at home. I had a disabled child at home for a while. I still had to make, like you said, push-ups at home, setups at home. Mm-hmm. You can do it. You don't need a gym membership to be able to do what you're telling them to do right now. I mean, that nope. just start. And uh, and I just appreciate, I mean, like you have just been, you're, you're such a genuine person and I, I don't, I mean, obviously you've met a lot of people throughout your time, but I remember the first time I met you, you were in Bell Buckle. I think it was at some type of the festival they had going on. You yeah, were at, probably at my store. You were at the store. You are at your store and your yeah, mom was store. in there. And my 16 yeah. year old, he was like young at the time came in and your mama just loved his little blonde country hair. And she just, she just raved over me. And I thought, what really nice people like that. You know, that was my first encounter with you guys. And I was like, I'm going to watch his show. And I sure enough, I, I sat there and, and watched, you know, and followed your music and stuff because you're just a genuine person and you can relate to people and you haven't let your fame and your accomplishments in life get to your head. You're all about giving back to your hometown and the people around you. And that just, that says something about you that there's not a lot of people like that these days. Thank you. That, that means a lot to me because it, it, it hasn't been easy, you know, and I struggle with, I struggle with everything. Uh-huh. Like I struggled with fame. 
Fame is a very devilish thing that no one can prepare a human being for. I bet. Because it's very customized. Like no one gets the same fame. It's very right. cut to each individual. And you, you just have to understand that money isn't real. It's just a byproduct from success. Success is real. Uh, fame is make-believe. None of us are like, we're all famous, you know what I'm saying, in our own way. And you just have to, like, one of the main things I learned, especially when it comes to like, the, in, the music industry is very competitive mm -hmm. and there's a lot of negativity out here. You know, there's a lot of haters and I had to learn just like anybody else has to learn on anything that don't be a hater. Like, right. Like don't be a hater. If someone else is succeeding, celebrate their success. Right. If you celebrate everyone's success, the party never stops. Like that. and That's good. I'm here. I'm here for the party. That's right. 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 I mean, life is what it is, but my life is a party. That's right. And as long as every day, if I surround myself with quality people who strive to succeed and I celebrate their successes, then we're the party's nonstop. That's right. You know, so I would just encourage people to try to be it's hard to it's hard. First of all, it's hard. Yeah. You gotta know it's hard. Life is hard. Work is hard. Health is hard. Relationships are hard. It's hard. But with the right kind of discipline and the right kind of direction, you can do just about anything. So don't beat yourself up over things being hard because it's hard for everyone, right? That's right. Um, and I tell myself that every day. I'm like, yo, it's hard. It is hard. <laughs> it's hard out here. No, it <laughs> but is. you know what? People are like, man, it's hard. It's hard to eat healthy. It's hard to to not eat these things. And I'm like, bro, it's hard being fat. Yeah. It's harder to be fat than it is to eat a salad, right? It's harder to be fat than it is to say no to barbecue ribs. Right. It's hard. That's right. Being fat's hard. So, and I, like I said, I I'm trying to promote just what I've learned because I know it's doable. Right. I know it's affordable. I know that it's accessible. Every grocery store has a produce section in it. That's right. It might not be as good as Sprouts, mm -hmm. but when you, like, I have to go all the way to the Sprouts and Murfreesboro yeah. to get my figs and my dates. Yes, I got some dates. And I'll do that. I'll drive all the way over there. Yeah. Yo, they're bulk. If you, we buy bulk, so we'll buy like two and a half pounds of dates, two and a half pounds of Turkish figs, uh -huh. fire. And that's my candy. Like I used to eat candy, chocolate. I was addicted to chocolate. Uh -huh. Now I eat, now I eat figs. Figs are so good. They are so good. Hey. Who did? Corey Bagwell. I don't know who that is. Sorry. Well, I've got people that are up here to see I understand. me. I get it. I get it. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I appreciate you know, you coming on, but before we close out here real quick, cause I know you've got, you're doing the food truck today with your wife. How can people find you obviously on social media, but go ahead and give everybody a plug, how to find you and, and what we talked about today. Yeah. So go to the real big hmm? Just go to my website. And that's the only thing you need to go to because there's a link on my website to where you can go to my Facebook, my Instagram, my YouTube, my Spotify, my my everything everything uh so just go to the real big .com. make sure you go down to social media and you look at those blogs and you'll find recipes and the, the, like how we got where we're at uh everything that we're serving today except for the poppers the recipes are on there uh so just go to the website it'll it'll take you everywhere absolutely and the name of the food truck if they want to check that out and share it with their local listeners how can they find that S Smoothieville. Smoothieville. I love yeah. it. Love it. Love it. Well, we thank yeah. you so. We thank your wife for cutting out time out of y'all's day to do this. And we appreciate you being a part of this unstoppable podcast. You both have been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I look forward to coming and seeing you guys real soon. Yes, absolutely. I'm unstoppable. 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 Unstoppable.